Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I am here with award-winning, best-selling author, uh, a coach, a counselor, um, you know, focused on tennis and the emotional, um, you know, part of tennis. And uh, he wrote a book that, you know, sort of is really important to me and I think really telling for young kids and, you know, a book that pros and pro coaches can also go back and reference um, in an attempt to help their player. And the, the title of the book is Emotional Aptitude in Sports with a subtitle of Stop Choking in Competition. And choking is such a loose word. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like I, we've seen players not finish. Uh, we've seen, you know, we, we categorize it as choke, but it could be panic. It could be whatever. But, you know, tell me about this is Frank Giampaolo. And tell me about the inspiration behind the book, where the stories and experiences come from. Yeah. No, thank you so much. And come on, it's good seeing you again. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, the, the book um, was written about five years ago. And uh, the inspiration really comes from the idea that at a lot of these national tournaments that I'm coaching the kids, um, when they end up losing a match, they hardly ever talk about stroke mechanics. They don't say, look, if I would have had my follow through two inches higher, I would have won the match. <laughs> they always talk about mental and emotional issues. Like like you say, I, I couldn't close out a lead. Uh, I'm choking, I'm panicking. Uh, you know, things like I get so nervous and fearful. So performance anxiety is, man, it really comes into play. And it's our job as coaches, not just to teach, you know, the hardware, the, the strokes and athleticism, but also the software of the individual. So the mental and the emotional. So um let me just categorize that just for a moment. So the mental, to me, the mental, and it's just my opinion, but it's more of the thinking side of the game. It's um, strategy and tactics and knowing your personal tennis identity, knowing your top patterns of play, how to expose what you're good at, how to expose, you know, if you love your forehands, you should be hitting right. mostly forehands. And your job is to expose your strengths. Um so the mental side covers a lot of a lot of those topics, but also things like score management, as you know, momentum management or energy management, focus management. Man, that's that's a hard that's a hard thing to do to think about an average tennis match is like 130 points, and we're we're asking these individual athletes, you gotta stay focused on task for you know 130 little mini wars. And uh, man, it's tough to do. So the emotional side is a little bit different. That's more of a performance anxiety. So we have the mental side of strategy, tactics, performance anxieties is more of the emotional side. And we get a lot of that with nervousness and fear. So yeah, let's chat about that stuff. I, I like the topic. Now, let me ask you this though, because as a coach, you know, we're, we're on the court, we're giving lessons, we're giving groups. Uh, we're trying to give them to hit as many balls as possible. Is the work around the emotional part for you mixed into the lesson? Like, are we going to spend 15 minutes uh, sitting at the chair, right, with the parent listening, analyzing this? Or is this like, hey, we're going to get our eight to 10 hours on court. We're also going to spend an hour or two in the classroom or you laying on my couch, right? Like, <laughs> I'm, I, like I'm a therapist. Tell me about how you integrate this work into it. Uh, and then we'll talk about some current events that kind of come to mind. Yeah, beautiful. Um, on the court, if I'm on the court with athletes, I really try to make sure that every practice session kind of simulates a real match. So we have simulated pressure drills, things like, uh, for example, negative scoring. So if an athlete has to do a certain task, let's just say really simply is we'll divide the service box into half on the ad side and and they have to just serve into the backhand half. Every time they get a serve in, they get a point. They're trying to get to 10. But if they miss the serve, it's minus one to their score. So they're accountable. They're accountable for mistakes. And that's really important, I think, in lessons because a lot of kids can walk away from a lesson and they, and they feel really good about their game. But they're not really aware of 
situational awareness and, and what shots they're making, what shots they're missing. So I think the key is to go a little bit past uh, stroke production and get more into the uh, why are you winning points or why are you not winning points. So um, a big key with me is making sure the kids are playing a lot of practice matches. And uh, that's where the competitive skills come into play. You know, that's where a lot of these things like opponent awareness, like how do you, how do you profile an opponent? How do you pay attention to, to their game? Because usually in lessons, we're so focused on our own game, our own skills. And uh, it's a different type of awareness. So it's a great question. And it's always a little bit different for different athletes. For me, um, sometimes I want the athlete to be in their conscious mind where they're doing editing and judging and they're trying to fix a mechanic. But then often I try to get them to not overanalyze and overjudge and try to get them into the subconscious frame of mind where they're where they're flowing and they're they're making choices without really analyzing. Because I think that's where they should be in matches. They should be in that subconscious frame of mind in matches. Um, and some of the kids take that judgmental editing frame of mind from a lesson and they do it in matches. And now they're overthinking. So it's, it's knowing when to use what side of the brain, I think maybe it's important. Yeah. So one of the things that I've done is in match play situations is, all right, the person that sort of struggles to finish, right? You'll say, okay, you know what? You're going to start off every game up 40, 15. Mm -hmm. That's on the do side, right? And if you lose that first point, now you're down low 15. Mm. So if you don't finish the game on that point, then it's almost like a natural point and the person that won the other side is a love 15. Uh, are those things, do you find helpful? Because I think at the junior level, like in a group setting, <laughs> that player ends up being down 4-0 and hating the match play. Be like, oh my God, that's stupid rule. I, da, 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 you know what I mean? Now I lost this person in practice, right? So in that situation, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. And in the pro situation, like if we had two pros on the court in Carson training, they're like, yeah, right. Okay. There's no way to simulate the pressure of being five all up 40 15 on yeah. Ash on court nine in Carson. Like, nice try, but it's not going to work. <laughs> how, do you, how do you incorporate the work? You know what I mean? The practicality without and, and trying to get them to take that serious when they know it's not an actual consequence. Yeah. Well, that's probably different too for each individual, but, uh, you know, it's all about controlling the controllables. And that's such a great term nowadays. And a lot of people use it. Um, I think that's really big. So for athletes to be able to focus on their present time awareness, why are they winning points? How are they winning points? How did they get up 40, 15? And then try to duplicate that. Most of the time, I think players get a lead. They drop their intensity level. They drop their focus level. Um they usually gift away a point or two and then they start to get upset. Um, or maybe the opponent now takes a great point w with a winner and, you know, it's back to juice. So that's probably one of the most common, I think, performance anxieties is closing out a lead. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the emotional aptitude, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you close it? Uh, to so me, what I think would your advice, what would be your advice to a pro? You know what I mean? Let's say a pro had six games, you know, they were up 40, 30 to break, 40, yeah. 15 to hold, right? Um, or, or had like six or seven game points, you know what I mean? In six or seven different games and lost all of them. What would be, I mean, you know, it's, you know, on one hand, you think, okay, play more aggressive, right? What do you have to lose? Well, another thing is like play a little bit more passive. Let them hit themselves out of the point, right? Out of the game, right? Uh, or s stay the same, right? And in that moment, maybe the player double faulted. Maybe, you know, like, would it stay the same? They may not even be aware of how I built the 40 15 lead. Maybe it was two or three unforced errors on the other person's part, a double. Yeah. Whatever. It was so hard, I think, in that moment to stay the same because <laughs> you're not really clear on how you got there, right? And then you have 40, 15, and you say, be aggressive, and then you overhit the return, yeah. right? You know what I mean? And, and the coach is like, shit, you should have just made the return, right? Make it. Right, 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 right. Right. And he's like, make a play, 
right? And then that brings you to a passive mode. So what do you, you know, how do you help someone who's an adult get out of yeah. that? Well, to me with any athlete, it's getting them to have the frame of mind that their mission is to just hit the shot the moment demands. And that that starts with knowing, you know, with their tennis identity, knowing their top plays and patterns. So what do they do best when they're returning a, a big first serve? What do they do best when they're returning a, a second serve on the on the ad side? Knowing what they already do best. I mm-hmm. think it starts there. What's their best serving patterns of play? Um, best rally pattern to get the opponent vulnerable? What's mm-hmm. their best short ball option? Do mm-hmm. they like to crush it, get it, move in and flatten it out? Mm-hmm. Or do they like to do approach shot to volley? So to me, the answer is really customized to the athlete. Knowing your identity, though, and knowing your top patterns of play is a great start. And then having the guts to do that without being fearful, without chickening out when you're up 40-15. And I like the idea about, you know, obviously make the opponent earn it. But uh, we have to, to me, we have to have our athletes know their game, trust their game, and do what they do best and, and stay on script. So it's a little bit like, you know, the L.A., the, the Hollywood actors and actresses, they they learn a script. They do dress rehearsals to run the script then they shoot the show. And a lot of the tennis athletes, I think they have to do the same thing. They have to know their script, which is their top pattern to play. They have to practice the script and practice matches a ton and then have the guts to, you know, shoot the show or do it in a real tournament. And uh I like the idea, though, and even if even if the, the players that I work with, even if they if they lose the point, but they're hitting the correct shot, the moment demands mm. and and it's a good error. And when we can detect that and, you know, as the good coaches, there's a big difference between a good error and a bad error and maybe a good error for those of you out there that might be listening to this. A good error is when they're hitting the correct shot from the mm. correct court position. If they miss that, I'm still happy with that. Um, but when they're hitting something reckless and random and that's bad. And it's kind of situational awareness, right? You hit the hit the correct ball when you're in a neutral situation. And if you get a short ball, use your offensive plays. And if you're on defense, go high and heavy deep down the middle, maybe. And and knowing your offense, neutral, defensive options mm-hmm. and just having that maturity to stay on your script. Mm-hmm. It's well, sounds easy, easy, but it's no, it's hard. Well, let me say it's it's hard. And I think when I look at this year's U.S. Open, I look Mm -hmm. at and I just look at, let's say, Coco, right? Because she's the champion that everyone watched. Right. Um, I look at Laura Siegman in the first round. Who, you know, I I would not say choked, but didn't finish the match. Right. Was up a set and a break. I think Uh, if you look at Mertens was up a set. If you look at. Um, Sabalinka was up a set and 40-15 to break. Uh, look at Muhova, who was up a set and I think and a break. Um, and I look at, I don't want to say all those players choked, but they just quite didn't finish when they yeah. had chances, right? And <clears throat> I'm one that speaks to Coco's fight. Right. And how she just never gives up all the way to the last ball. You can never sort of rest that this person's going to go away. Right. So yeah. like, major kudos for her fight and her grit. Um, but also talks about the fragility of a lead and yeah. mentally how fragile it is. So let's, I want to talk about one point like emotions override everything. Right. Yeah. And, and that's in your book. And the reason why I say emotions is when you are on Arthur Ashe or when you're on Louis Armstrong and you got 20,000 people rooting for the other player, which all of Coco's opponents felt, right? It's like yeah. 20,000 plus one, right? You're fighting all these people. You cannot <laughs> help but be emotional, right? Emotional that they're not cheering for me. Emotional that like, hey, I have an opportunity to make it to the, the next round, whether it be the quarter, semi, the finals, all those yeah. career milestones. So talk about emotions overriding everything. Yeah, sure. Um... I think the, I think the way our brains work is that um, your emotions are going to override your stroke mechanics, and also your cognitive functioning, right? Your 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 thought process, and you know they they call it um, 
the amygdala hijack. And it's when you get emotionally hijacked. And a lot of players can relate to this, but you get to this point in the match where we get so overwhelmed by the emotions of the, of the, of the moment. It could be just a junior tournament at a club. It could be a national, it could be a pro tournament, but when they get hijacked, this emotional hijack, they can't find their strokes anymore. And they're just basically done. They, they, they cannot even hit balls anymore. You just see shanks and everything. So when they get hijacked, that's really interesting for me. So, um, I really spend a lot of time kind of researching the amygdala hijack and this little part of your brain that if it gets over overflown with some of these chemicals, um, like adrenaline, cortisone, but if it, if it gets overflown, you you can't even reach the certain part of your brain in the front frontal lobes of your brain. So and how, that's and what's it called? The amygdala? Yeah, the amygdala hijack. And if anybody's interested in that. Um, obviously just Google that. That's just, mm-hmm. that's just, uh, it's not necessarily a tennis term, but it's anybody that's under pressure that they feel so much pressure that they get emotionally hijacked and then they cannot even play anymore. And so they have to realize when that's starting to happen. And, uh, there are, there are ways to go do like in between point routines and rituals to kind of calm down and breathe and take little timeouts as much as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and lowering your heart rate is such a big key. I was gonna um, say, does breathing help that? Like, what would you say? Hey, it's five all dues, third set, semis of U.S. Open, and it, and I feel it. How do I yeah. rectify it in the forty-five seconds I have between points? Yeah, I think a big key is that ability to reset, which means our athletes have to practice the in-between point routines, not just the hitting, but the thinking part, which comes in between every point, right? So it's their ability really, uh, and I'll, I use a little image sometimes with my athletes that they have like a balloon right above their head and call it like the stress balloon. But if they miss a shot or play a bad point, they're putting air and they're blowing up the balloon and say they don't do any in-between point routines. Now they play another poor point. They, they add more air, more air. And then once that balloon pops, they're done. They can't even find the game anymore and they don't know what they're doing out there. So they have to try to really de-stress or deflate this balloon after every point that's stressful for them to be able to walk away and say, okay, now I have to get the air out of the balloon. And mm. uh, so a lot of the players that we work with, it's, it's not stroke related, but it's calming themselves down enough so they can now actually think and problem solve. Mm. Well, let me ask you this, though. So what is, because I think, you know, even as coaches and uh, commentators, right, we use the word choke, and choke is, you know, probably overused. Yeah. Um, tell me what you think choking is versus panicking, right? You talk about it in your book. And yeah. you know, I'm, now I'm at the point, you know, I, I've got great players now that I work with that are great communicators. And they okay. say, you know, at this point, I panicked. Right. And I don't know why. I was like, it was like zero, zero, like in a third, <laughs> I panicked or whatever it is. You know what I mean? I panicked. So tell me yeah. the difference between what you think is choking and panicking. Yeah. Well, I real basically to me, choking is when uh, an athlete is overthinking about unwanted contaminants. So they're thinking about the outcome, the what ifs. What if I win? What if I lose? Who do I play next? What are my parents going to say? <laughs> panicking is like, underthinking and it's panicking is when we have to get our athletes to to kind of calm down and, and and lower their energy out there so you see panic you see panic in players that are walking fast and they're not doing any in between point routines or rituals and they're just racing through and uh, that's a little bit more of a panic mode for some of the kids that I work with and choking is again that's kind of opposite that's where they have to raise their energy and get back into the here and now like okay what is my script what is what are my patterns of play what should i be doing right now in this point to get them to stop thinking about the future Mm -hmm. so yeah overthinking or underthinking so uh, i see that a lot and we all we've all done it i mean it's it happens yeah closing out leads right we talk about exposure Mm -hmm. 
versus avoidance. Yeah. Tell me about, well, let's put that in layman's terms for our listeners. Yeah, well, um, anything that our athletes are scared of, anything they're fearful of, what do they need more of, exposure or avoidance? So it's a good question to ask the athletes when they start talking about things that they're scared of. So what, what do you need? Do you need more avoidance of that topic or exposure? So that could be anything from, I'm, I don't like playing eight in the morning matches. I don't like playing in the wind. I don't like playing pusher retrievers. I don't like it if I'm playing against the top seed or I don't like it if I'm a top seed and I'm playing somebody else. So anything that they feel stress about, I think it's our job to get them to have more exposure because when they're comfortable with it, it's a little bit easier. And and junior athletes can kind of take the idea that like right now we're getting close to Halloween, right? So the first time a, a child goes into a haunted house, it's unknown. And they're scared of this this little procedure they go through. But once they go through it three or four times, they're not scared anymore. So it's getting them past the unknown, the fear of the unknown. Um, when players have a big lead, like 5-2, they need to close it out. I think what happens most of the time is our athletes take their foot off the gas. They start to go into defensive mode. Like, okay, don't blow it again. Just keep the ball in play. Be safe. So they trade in this solid, aggressive play, like controlled aggression. They trade in that for don't lose, don't blow it. And so what we see when we watch matches and video, we see a player hitting, you know, 80 mile an hour ground strokes deep. Now they get a lead and they start to protect the lead and they start hitting 50 miles an hour short. And then, of course, the opponent has a different view right there. When they're behind, they have nothing to lose. They basically say, uh, you know, I'm going to lose anyway. I might as well just hit. Then right. they relax. Right. And so they go up a level. Our athletes are going down a level. And, you know, boom, now it's back to five all. And now, so, when, when you ask a player that, like, do they need more avoidance? Would you actually, like, entertain that? If you say, I need more, uh, you know, we're struggling with X. Do you need more uh, exposure to it? Or would you like us to avoid it? Would you actually avoid it? Like, is that really a solution? I think avoiding avoiding a topic is um, is valid. It's valid when uh, we're trying to get kids to quit, to quit something, to maybe stop doing bad choices and bad habits. So, like, avoiding doing a, a bad choice, like avoid going for a winner down the line off a deep cross court ball. You have to avoid that. Sometimes they have to avoid things. They have to avoid uh, maybe an athlete doesn't like to eat before they play. They go, I'm too nervous. I can't eat. Well, we got to break that habit. We got to avoid that habit. So some sometimes it is avoidance, but most of the time it's they need more exposure in under stress. And, uh, you know, one of the typical things we see in tennis is the kids take a lesson on Friday and there's no pressure. The pro hits it right back to them, right into their primary strike zone. And they're just nailing that sucker. And they're thinking, man, I'm going to go pro. This is so easy. And so they're just playing catch back and forth. It's a cooperating game of catch. The parents watch it. The parents are like, my kid's amazing. Then the next day, Saturday comes along, and they play a match. And now all of a sudden, it's a violent game of keep away. It's not a nice game of catch anymore. And now the kid goes down in flames. And the, the parents are like, I don't get it. My kid's so good in practice, but they stink in matches. Well, usually it's because they're not practicing in the manner they're expected to perform. They're, they're practicing playing catch back and forth instead of, you know, the violent game of keep away. So I think that's a big concept as well. Mm. Mm. Now, focus management intensity and intensity management, right? Momentum yeah. Management. Like, I think the the momentum, right? Mm. And even even if it's like points, right? Like you, you can go and run a string and win two and a half games where you win 10 points in a row, right? And then you look up and like, oh, I won 10 points in a row. And then it like, <laughs> then it all goes to hell, right? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And so I think that momentum wise, and then also momentum and schedule. You know, you see people get hot. Like I saw, we saw Iga Swiatek, right? Get hot. 
and went yeah. like 30 something matches and like kept playing. I'm like, perfect. Like, if that was me, you're right. Keep playing, right? Until you kind of lose the momentum. But tell me about a focus, intensity management, and momentum management. Well, yeah, that is a big part of the mental emotional side, isn't it? And we, when we coach athletes, we, we get to the point where we trade in focusing on forehand, backhand, serve, volley, and we start focusing on things like focus management. Where is your brain? What are you thinking about right now? Um, and there are different kinds of distractions, right? There's internal distractions, and then there's those external distractions. And, and uh, different kids get distracted way more than others. But that's part of the focus management to get the athlete to understand just because their body is on court six doesn't mean their brain is still there. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's typical. Yeah. But intensity management, man, that's tough. I think it's hard to stay intense for a whole match. Um, especially nowadays with with the kids with their cell phones and they're used to things like TikTok and Instagram where everything is a 10 second dopamine hit. And now we're saying you have to stay focused on your top patterns of play for two hours straight. And they're like, what the heck? I can't even stay focused for 10 seconds, man. Right, right. right two hours. Right. Um, yeah. Momentum is big, isn't it? In matches, understanding who has the energy, the positive energy. And we see it a lot in matches. You see one player, just on fire they're not really in that conscious thinking frame they're just flowing it's beautiful and then 20 minutes later the other person has all the positive energy and and our athlete is whining and complaining and they lose all the momentum and so it does shift back and forth so understanding when you need to take the momentum back from the opponent and that could be things like you know time management um we see players breaks bathroom breaks exactly i mean we're seeing I mean, that so much we see people um and, and yeah. you know I, I think there's there's definitely uh becoming taboo or there's a sportsmanship component to it now but i mean yeah. i'm kind of like look it's like a timeout in basketball you should use all the tools available to win this match right if you win if you win the third round u.s open maybe you got a cupcake in the fourth round boom so now you're two rounds ahead of where you are if you just sort of manage this moment we'll try to steal it back. And then you see people who like call for the trainer when they're up a set in a break. And it was like, no, 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 don't call for the trainer. <laughs> like, keep going. You know what I mean? Like, so you, you yeah. look at people who don't manage the momentum. Yeah. Um, or, or really don't understand it. It also is just like your forehand or your backhand. It is a tool that's at your disposal. So, um, you know, I agree that now we're, now I think we're seeing it live in, in living color. Like Tissipass, like the other guys who are like mm. taking these bathroom breaks at very odd times when they're losing, they come back and it actually turns the match around. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so is that something, in your opinion, that we should encourage juniors to use? Or is it on the side of poor sportsmanship? Well, it's a great question. And uh, I think as long as it is legal, you should use it because everybody else is using it. Um, as it, if it becomes illegal, then it obviously it's against good sportsmanship. But, but I agree with you that it is a form of taking a little mini time out. It's, it's like being the cooler. You're, you need to cool the hot opponent down if they're on fire. And so that's where you're going to do things like the gals are going to go back and redo their, redo their ponytails and, right. They're going to change rackets. They're going to tie their shoes. They're going to do whatever they need to do to stay on the in the on the, on the court and in the match longer, right? And that's I think it's valid, and it happens in every tournament, and it's it's part of the drama of competition. Can you handle that? And that's one of the things that makes tennis so fun is can you handle the mental and emotional roller coaster rides of matches and understanding that there's going to be drama. Almost every match, you're going to face drama. You hey, better... I love it. We need a little bit of drama in tennis. Yeah. yeah right. I think so, too. I, I uh, love it. I'm all for that kind of momentum management, you know, intensity management. Um, but that's something that we can talk to the athletes about when they play live points, when they're making their own decisions. And that's a little bit different. Most of the time when kids are out there doing tennis lessons, the coaches are telling them what to do. So the coach is making the decisions. He's saying maybe, okay, let's go four cross court and one down the line, or let's do an approach shot, volley overhead. And it's preset. 
But now you get into the match and now the athlete has to make the decisions when to hit where and when to go in. And that's, that's always fun. So we have to teach them to be the great decision makers, problem mm-hmm. solvers. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and yeah. And, and I think one of the things is we see a lot in tennis is perfection. We see a lot of kids, uh, in my opinion, right, um, who get what they want. They get their way. They mm-hmm. take their lessons at the time that's most convenient for them, especially if they're good. Like if they're good, the whole world does stop for them. Even if they're just a good 15 year old, right? <laughs> The whole yeah. world may not stop for them, but the whole club would stop for them, right? Whatever their home club is and the other big dog in the city, time time stops for them, right? Um, and so their whole situation is often perfect. And we see players who, you know, are going through all the repetition, trying to hit the perfect shot, um, and we see them not really – develop an understanding or a willingness to just do what it takes to win right so the shot wasn't perfect but it was a foot off the baseline it had good pace yeah you could have hit a little bit harder but that one was good enough right um and we see a lot of players with great strokes yeah never materialize because you know they just are so like you know like the topic in your book is you know perfection perfectionism is toxic and, you know, we don't see them, you know, if I look at like this year's U.S. Open, I look at all of these matches and, you know, even Djokovic, right? Djokovic two down, down, down two sets to none against Jerry, not playing a great match, goes to the bathroom, manages the momentum, comes yeah. back and sort of finds a way to win, right? You look at Coco, who kind of fought her way through a lot of imperfect matches. Um, and so tell me your experience with sort of, perfectionists right and how you get them how you help them realize just how toxic it is not even to a match but also to a practice yeah you know what i mean like i'm telling you that forehand was great you say it wasn't hard enough or you say it was too flat right you know what i mean the, the yeah despair, right and it's this back and forth where you got a kid who doesn't know what they're talking about and you got a <laughs> knows, right you got a coach who knows look at a level two, that ball would win the whole tournament, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So tell me about your experience with that. Well, I, I, we see it a lot, that's for sure. Um, perfectionism, and it seems to be more of a life skills trait. It, um, the kids that are straight A students are usually the kind of kids that are perfectionists in, in sports too. But yeah, so I, I think it's really meaningful that we try to get the kids to just shoot for excellence, Try to be excellent today. Don't worry about being perfect. You're going to miss some shots, especially if you're a, you know, a shot maker. If you're more of a disruptor out there, you're going to miss some volleys. You're going to miss some overheads. But if you keep going and keep playing your style of tennis, that's in your best interest. Um, you know, some kids are more grinders. Some athletes are just going to chase balls down and keep balls in play, and uh, they might not make as many unforced errors. But still, the idea of getting away from perfectionism, I think uh, a great skill to have is focus on just winning two out of three points, like 66%. That's a huge winning percentage. And most players are going to win every match they ever play their whole life if they're winning 66%. Mm -hmm. And that's just two out of three. So look, if a play or a pattern works, recognize it, do it again, do it again, keep doing it again. Until the opponent figures it out. Yeah. But, our, you know, a lot of our kids are like, no, wait, this could be a trick. I, I better do something different. Right. They might get used to it. And now they leave a winning play. And it's just silly. But, yeah, so if you feel like you have that kind of perfectionism trait inside you, I think it's meaningful just to have the athletes Google it and YouTube perfectionism and why it's so toxic. And sometimes – when they learn things for themselves, they can teach themselves. And uh, that goes a long way in tennis. I really try to ask athletes um, the question, instead of telling them what to do, I ask them, what do they think they should do? What do you think a better option would be? But what, what would you do if you could do it again? And so that concept of, if we ask them what to do, it creates that environment where they're problem solving. And if we keep telling them what to do, now it sometimes it hurts their ego and they don't want to listen. 
So I don't think telling is the uh, is the right idea. I think asking is a great way to get a a person that's maybe more of a perfectionist to uh, look deeply and come up with their own answers because it ultimately it has to come from them anyway. So we really don't teach them how to play. We're teaching them how to teach themselves. So when they go into a match, they can problem solve and they can manage all these mental, emotional skills. So, Yeah. I mean, I think when you look at like, you know, if you, if you watch tennis on TV, you see very few sets that are 0-1-0. Right? Yeah. Even in juniors. You, and if you come back to me and you tell me you want a match 0-1-0, I mean, on the pro tour, if you went 0-1-0, get on and get off the court. Right. But in the junior yeah. level, it's kind of like, okay, well, what did you work on? When you realize that the person couldn't beat you and you're, you know, you're 16 years old, right? You realize yeah. the person couldn't beat you. Did you serve in volley a few times to practice working on that? Yeah. Did you, you know, do a chip and charge to be working on that? Like, so, you know, perfectionism actually impedes a lot of progress and it does not really impress me as a coach because it means you really didn't take this opportunity where there was a clear gap in ability yeah. to get better. Right. Um, yeah. There's no such thing as a goal. I mean, I think maybe I had one golden set my whole career, um, but that's really not the goal. You know what I mean? And, and on tennis yeah. on TV, no one's winning 0 and 0, having golden sets throughout the tournament. So it's really sort of a bit. And so I would say, if you're a perfectionist, you should choose another sport because <laughs> I mean, even yeah. if you look at a draw, right? Let's say you know the tournament is a 64 draw, 63 mm -hmm. people are going to lose. Yeah. Right. And perfectionists always have a hard time losing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, Only sure. missing, but losing. And so this isn't a sport where you're going to win every week. And so this would really give you a very poor quality of life. This sport yeah. will ruin your quality of life if you are a perfectionist. You know what I mean? Uh, I do. And so th those are some of the tricks that I just try to tell my students is like, look, if you're up 6 0 3 0, Try serving in volley and chipping and charging, right? You know, whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? It's just, oh, try yeah. to swing volleys, right? Just at, at the junior level. At the pro level, let's let's get back to the hotel, right? Just went on and on and back to the hotel. Yeah. So the <laughs> level, let's take this time to improve. Um, so, I mean, how do you how do you deal with the perfectionist in practice? Obviously, you're there to coach them through it. But in a match situation, is that something you advise players? Uh, yeah, I think uh, – no, I think that the idea for me is – have our kids understand what their peak performance level is when they're playing at close to their top level and, and their job at a match, even throughout a tournament is try to play close to their peak performance level. That's all they can really control. Anyway. Um, they can't really control the outcome. They can influence it, but they can't really control the outcome, but yeah, getting them to look at their, their performance level. And if they can, if they can keep maximizing that level, like you said, sometimes it's, working on contingency plans that they they might need later on in their in their future. But I'll give you an example. Um, I was helping a, a gymnast in which I don't know anything about gymnastics, but the parents called me and we talked about some of these topics. And so this gal, the, the, the highest she ever got with the scoring was uh, 8.6 in, in a, a big national event. So she's going to this national and uh, she gets, I think, a 9.2 she exceeds all of her expectations. And then two hours later, a Russian girl gets a 9.6 and wins the gold. <laughs> but, but my point to them was, does, does that mean you were, you were crummy? You didn't win the, the gold? Or did you reach your peak performance level? And she said, well, yeah, I, I exceeded my level. Well then, well, then you did it. Right. That's it. That's all you can control, man. Is, yeah. And so I think tennis players can look at it with that lens, you know. Well, man, let me tell you, I, I really appreciate the time you gave us. You know, you, you came recommended by Paul Anacone, who mm. we, we all agree knows his stuff. Yeah. Um, and so that's a big testament to your ability. Uh, what do you have going on now and where can people find you? You know, is this like is, is this sort of uh, help you provide available via phone, Zoom? Do we have to come to Cali to see you? Like, tell us, tell us how we connect. Yeah. No, thanks so much. Um yeah, my, uh, my, I'm all over the, the, the internet. Just Google me and, and, and you can get my email, my phone number and that kind of thing. But yeah, I spend a lot of my time. I do a lot of coaching conferences about once a month. Um, I travel. I was just in Boca a couple of days ago. I traveled to families that 
that want to work on some of these topics, the mental emotional skills. And, you know, most of the time they, they realize that the kids have been working for years on their strokes, but they haven't even started working on their mental emotional yet. And so um, I travel. I live in Southern Cal. I live in Laguna. And uh, yeah, with, I, with Paul Anacone, I, I do the, the high performance USGA um, Southern Cal group. So we work with the top kids here and we just kind of have fun doing this stuff. And, you know, I'm really trying to teach Paul and he, he's getting it. He's finally. Yeah. Started it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this, this topic comes when I first started coaching on tour. Uh, I was, talking to like Zena Garrison, Billie Jean. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh man, that girl's so good. Like you start to see like these big hitters. And you know, you hear Billie say, yeah, she's good, but she can't finish. Right? Or, you know, um, or uh, Zena, you know, they say, she's good, but she can't, she can't win. She she doesn't know how to finish. Right? Yeah. Um, I was even taught, we were having a conversation with a legend whose name I won't mention. I think they (laughs) lost in the finals of like Wimbledon. And it was like, why is that your favorite Wimbledon? You didn't win. They was like, well, I got to the final. She's like, well, that's not winning, nor no. is it finishing. So you didn't finish. So when I, when, I, when, I, when I read the book, it takes me back to that conversation of, you know, can the player finish, right? And I think that, you know, coaches at all levels struggle with it, players at all levels struggle. So I, I really appreciate this. I hope that the, the listeners had that notepad out. I mean, I I really, I wrote down a few things like hit the shot, the moment demands. You know what I mean? It's just, I, I really appreciate some of the, the 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 insight that you gave, and it's very valuable. Well, thanks so much. I, you know, I appreciate it. I appreciate doing it. And uh, yeah, if we can get to make better choices and better habits, I think they're going to really, uh, they're going to do well. So, athletes out there, look deep inside yourself. What kind of choices and habits are you? are you doing that's hurting you that you might need to change? So flip that and you'll be fine. Yeah. And uh, we'll be watching you guys on TV. All right. Well, this has been a tennis.com podcast with award-winning author, um, mental coach, obviously consultant to the USTA, my new consultant, um, Frank Giampaolo.